So welcome to lecture 18 of MCS 507, a course on scientific software. And today I will explain how to make animations. Um, one can make animations very quickly uh, from a Python script uh, using matplotlib. Um, that's the first part of this lecture, how to make uh, very quickly a visualization. Um, but then I'm going to go a little bit uh, deeper into Tkinter. Uh, Tkinter is built in with Python and allows you to define very interesting graphical user interfaces. Um, the middle part will be devoted to a classical example of a bouncing ball, um, a billiard ball essentially, um, which is perhaps not so useful, but already is useful enough to illustrate the basics of uh, graphical user interfaces more than just a canvas. So we will define buttons that define actions. Uh, it's, by the way, another uh, very good introduction to object-oriented programming. As I indicated in one of the earliest uh, lectures in this course, uh, object-oriented programming one can appreciate fully when it comes to uh, graphical user interfaces. So the third part of this lecture goes actually more into science. Um, and computational algebraic geometry in the modeling of a four-bar mechanism. Okay, uh, let's start with the beginning. And uh, IPython uh, can be seen as the precursor to the Jupyter notebook. Um, it is uh, extremely good if you are still very much uh, a terminal or a PowerShell oriented uh, person. So here I launched uh, the IPython uh, with PyLab in the PowerShell environment. Um, so it says what IPython is and also it refers to matplotlib. Uh, so with PyLab, you have essentially automatically a plotting environment as well, uh, without having to resort to the Jupyter notebook. Um, so in, in, in a way, uh, we are using more and more by default the Jupyter notebook, but the IPython is more an intermediary between the pure interactive terminal computations. And then also like here, you have the visualization. So this is a visualization of a regression. Um, so we have a line um, where the samples are taken essentially from the line, but with added uh, random noise. So making this regression plot, so the black line uh, clearly indicates the trend of the point cloud. Um, so with linear regression, you can compute the slope of the, or you can define even the slope of these points in the least square sense. Making these plots uh, can happen very, very quickly. So with five uh, statements, so we define first the range going from 0 to 2 with a step of uh, 5 over 100. Then the noise, uh, we so the second statement makes uh, a random uh, vector of noise uh, as long as the number of points. And then uh, the third statement uh, defines the data points. Um, so uh, PyLab um, is also incorporating a lot of the uh, 
NumPy SciPy environment. So you don't need to import or uh, try to figure out in which package, in which module of which package is this poly fit. No, you have it immediately. Um, so, and then the plotting, um, the one statement, so we can plot uh, the dots with in blue, so the X and the Y coordinates. Then we have the exact line. Oh, no, I'm sorry, we have the fitted line. So what polyfit returns is the slope M and the intercept B. So the fitted line will be drawn in a black uh, full line. Um, it's a it's a thick line. The line width is twice of what it uh, by default would be. So if one executes this plot statement, then another window pops up with the plot, uh, the same plot that was on the previous slide. And then one can uh, decorate uh, this plot. Uh, you can add the uh, vertical label, the regression, and also then say that the grid, uh, adapt the grid to it. So I'm going back to the previous slide. Um, in a couple of statements, we have a nice plot. Um, okay, so the point here now is one can also do this in a script and one can make animations uh, with the same ease. Um, so here we have a sign function. Um, over the interval 0 to pi. So the sine function completes, so ar arrives at the same point. Uh, so if you know the sine function between 0 and 2 pi, you also know it between 2 pi and 4 pi, etc. etc. So periodicity will uh, play an important role in also the next uh, animation in the second part of this lecture. Okay, um, we can make, uh, we can use this in an interactive uh, session, uh, but we can also do this in a script. Uh, so the script has indeed then the benefit that uh, you essentially store uh, the commands there for future runs. And now the code runs in a regular Python script, uh, you have to import then the commands that will be used from PyLab. Um, so in, in actually the first exercise would be to put the uh, statements of the first plot, put them in a script and also run it then from within a script. So we can show, so if we do the show at the very end, uh, that will uh, display, that will create another window. So another window will pop up with the plot in it. We can also alternatively save uh, the plot and um, as with save fig, and here I'm using now the pyplot environment imported as plt. Also explicitly uh, using the NumPy here, the lint space from NumPy. So we save this as a portable graphics object, the PNG file, um, in the current folder. Okay, so we can do the same thing uh, with animations or scientific movies. So the sign function belongs to an entire family of signs running at increasing frequencies. So we can make an animation out of this. Um, and here I should probably have a demonstration. So for the beginning of this lecture, I don't have uh, demonstrations, but they will come for the sections two and three. So the point of uh, the remaining slides in this first part of the lecture is that it is very easy to make an animation, just a couple of statements. Uh, you actually spend more work um, doing the setup. Um, so what do we want to do? 
um, I want to define uh, a function. So uh, this works if the what you want to animate is uh, defined by one single function. So here we want to plot functions, uh, sine functions with increasing frequency. So what we're going to animate has one single parameter and that is the frequency. So the frequency start at zero, so that's why the first sine function will start at frequency plus one. So that's our sine function and we will plot that sine function over the range 0 to 2 pi. So we define the axis, the x limit and the y limit, and that defines the plot. So uh, that is making essentially one frame of the animation. So one can also see an animation as a sequence of plots. Okay, uh, here it is then. Um, the, the animation uh, is being created by the facility funk animation. We give it a figure window, a function, and the number of frames. So that's, we have to do, declare the, the figure now. The previous uh, slide defined uh, the function that we want to animate and then we can also save this uh, as an animated GIF file for example. So that will save our animation. Uh, Image Magic uh, was my default um, tool on a Mac uh, but when I ran this on Windows uh, the error message came up that it used Pillow and actually it was only a warning Pillow is the uh, image processing library from Python. Okay, so that's to make animations plain and simple, uh, where the what you want to animate is defined by one single function. Um, this is very powerful. Um, okay, so um, in the second part we will look at building graphical user interfaces. So graphical user interfaces allow uh, the user to interact. So in a graphical user interface, there is no more a main program. Uh, so the user is in control. In a main program, it is that main program that decides the sequence of actions. But with Tkinter, uh, the action is defined by the user, the user who will push buttons, adjust uh, variables with scales. Okay, so we start with a very basic uh, animation, and it's a, it's a very plain animation, but there is already a very nice uh, mathematical idea in this. So what will our... Uh, animation do, it will visualize a moving billiard ball. Uh, so a ball rolling over a pool table and it bounces against the edges of the table. Um, so in this lecture I will try to go carefully over the basic features. Uh, so then the extra features, the addition, will be added later on. Um, so in some sense this could also be an exercise of inheritance. Uh, so one takes the basic graphical user interfaces and then one adds extra features to it. Now the, the nice thing about object-oriented programming here is that there are two main important issues when you build a graphical user interface. You have to define the layout of your window and then you have the actions associated with certain elements in the layout. So you can very clearly separate the layout, how everything is placed and looks, from the actions. So uh, if you think about uh, this problem, so again the first sentence uh, of this uh, slide, we consider a rolling ball that bounces against the edges of a table. So there are many things that you, when you imagine this, there are many things that 
you have the pool table, but then you also have the uh, balancing action. So the nice thing is a programmer that you can actually separate those two. Here is the main mathematical idea. Um, so um, you could think of, if you think of the, the, the left picture, uh, the left picture shows the arrows uh, give the direction of the movement. Uh, so the black dot is where the animation started. So our animation will start at some random position at the table and then also use a random direction. So these are the main data attributes that will be maintained, uh, the direction and the position of the ball. Now, if you look at uh, the left picture, you may be, uh, if you think about this, so this computing these arrows and the positions, uh, you constantly will have to check for the angles also be very careful that you don't run off the table that you don't lose your ball well uh, the other picture on the slide uh, represents the idea that instead of working with one table uh, you work with infinitely many tables uh, so instead of one table and um, having all these vectors uh, computed on them. You have only one vector, but the vector stretches over all the tables. Now, how does this help? Um, well, the infinitely long table is actually a sequence of tables and is folded. Uh, so once we know, so from the current location, we can compute the position of the table so here we end so we start at uh, say 1 1 that's our first uh, pool table we go to the second one stay still on the same row but then we move up so we go from 1 1 to 5 4 and uh, there is an even odd row and depending on the even and the odd will actually give us whether the arrow has to be reflected or not. So there is the reflection of the arrow that will be determined by the position of the current ball in the pool table. So I hope to make that more precise, but that's the main idea. Here is the layout of the pool table, and it's a little bit unfortunate that uh, one does not see, um, so I have to fix this slide, one doesn't actually see the two buttons at uh, the end. So there is a start button and a stop button and a canvas. So these are the three uh, main elements of the GUI. So we have uh, thus our uh, basic um, layout so the elements or the components of a graphical user interface are called widgets so we have the canvas uh, we have then two buttons that will start and stop the animation so with the canvas uh, we will uh, so the start and the stop button will change um, so the the, the the canvas will be used uh, for the drawing. So the start uh, will trigger a, a loop that will stop whenever uh, the loop variable is uh, changed by the stop button. So the status of the animation, whether it is ongoing or running, uh, or whether it is in a stop position, will be another data attribute. Um, so there are data attributes, as I mentioned, uh, the position and the orientation of the ball. But then there is also the state of the animation. So here on this slide, uh, inwards are actually the definitions of the, um, of the GUI. So what are the widgets? 
uh, what are the data attributes in addition to these widgets, what are the other data attributes, the position, the direction, and then the state of the animation. And then we have the two functions or the two methods. We live in the object-oriented world here. The two methods, start and stop, that are defined by the class. Okay, so here it is then. So this is the skeleton of the class. So we have a class billiard ball. Uh, we import from Tikinter um, a canvas, a button, and then also the west and the east orientation. From the math library we have the sine and the cosine. Pi is also useful. Uh, we will start with random uh, numbers, so with random integers. Uh, so there is the init. The init creates an object and that will define the layout. Um, there are the start and the stop buttons. Uh, the animation that controls the drawing uh, is a separate function. Uh, so for symmetry, starting and stopping is then uh, controlling the state variable, so when the state will change, and uh, the start will call the animate. There is still a main program. Uh, so this is when the program runs from within a terminal window. Um, I have a Jupyter Notebook waiting, and I will then scroll through that in Jupyter Notebook as well. And hopefully I will be able to demonstrate how this GUI works. Okay, what does the constructor do? The constructor uh, defines uh, the widgets but also the stores all the dimensions uh, and the parameters of the GUI. Uh, we will be also for later use, uh, so we have to build in a delay, uh, so that will determine the speed of the uh, observed speed of the billiard ball. Um, we are drawing essentially not pixel by pixel, but there will be an increment. Um, so that also, that increment, uh, instead of having a ball, you could also imagine uh, a hopping, a hopping ball. Um, <coughs> so then we have the critical variables, uh, the state of the animation and the coordinates of the ball. Um, and then uh, there are the three widgets. So when I specify the widgets, um, I had the um, main canvas was in my slide, as I showed, was actually completely dominating, was in uh, was spanning two columns. And then the buttons uh, are stretched out in row one. So we start counting from zero, columns zero and one below the canvas. Okay, so here now starts the uh, constructor. So what the constructor does, it also makes it, it, it is not only static. So that word, that constructor is also the initializer of the graphical user interface. You see that the two last lines uh, define the initial coordinates of the ball. Uh, but the ball is not moving, so the state of the animation is false. Okay, so we pass the window also to the, to the GUI, uh, to the constructor, uh, the dimension because that's needed, we need to know um, how many pixels uh, our square uh, pool table is, um, and then the other parameters. So they are stored. Uh, so it's important to realize the distinction between the formal parameters, uh, here the WDW, the dimension, the increment, and the delay. Uh, the dimension, increment, and delay, these formal parameters are stored as the data attributes.
and the window essentially already exists um, outside uh, this constructor. So the window is passed through to the widgets. Uh, so we have the canvas widget and the button widget. So with the canvas widget, we give the dimension uh, here, the width and the height, uh, which is the same, and then the background color. We define the position with the grid. Uh, so the canvas spans two columns. There is a start button and a stop button. So the C and V is a data attribute. Uh, so when we make a canvas, we are essentially calling the constructor of the canvas class. So we get an instance of the uh, canvas object. Okay, so the same for the button. So buttons have text attributes and very importantly, there is a command associated with it. So the command is uh, defined by the method start that belongs to the class. So whenever you have a self dot something, whatever is after the dot is a member of the class. So we distinguish between data members, data attributes also called, and uh, functional members or functional attributes. So they are called the methods. So the start and the stop are the methods of this class. And we define also the grid. And the buttons are made big, we stretch them with the W and the E labels, so West and East, they are stretched. Okay, then um, for symmetry, we have the animate function. So the start button changes the state to true, the stop button changes the state to false. Okay, so then comes the main action. Uh, we have the animate. So the animate is actually going to each time when it runs. Uh, so you could imagine that somebody gives the billiard ball a kick. Um, so there will be a random angle. Uh, so that angle could have been in a more general implementation, could have been also a parameter of the method. And in a m more in a better uh, in a in a more extended design of this class, the user could then also define the angle. Um, here, the angle is very good uh, to define the direction of the vector. Um, so, with the direction, uh, so defining a vector by a, an angle uh, makes that the cosine and the sine we get already immediately a unit vector. Um, and the unit vector is then multiplied with the increment. Um, so from the current position, we're going to add uh, the increment in the direction. And there is a delay, uh, so the canvas will be updated after some delay. Oh, oh, and there is the method draw ball. Uh, so the method draw ball was not really uh, specified earlier on in the skeleton, uh, but the draw ball is kind of an auxiliary function. Um, so the draw ball defines the way the ball is uh, represented on canvas as a red dot. Here is the uh, draw ball. Oh wait, uh, the draw ball uh, the draw ball also does a very other important uh, uh, function. The, the draw ball, ball gets some coordinates, um, but it has to map the coordinates back to the table. Uh, so what the animate did was computing that the endpoint of the very, very long arrow that stretches on forever. So, but of course, uh, the pool table is finite, 
So the coordinates must be mapped back to the table. And that actually gives the uh, realistic bouncing effect. So here we have the mapping to the table with uh, quotient and uh, remainder calculation. So depending on, so we divide uh, by the dimension. And we, it may be that the position when the direction was downward, that the position is negative. Um, so we have the quotient. Uh, the quotient is going to tell us in which pool table we are. And uh, the remainder will then also, so we have even and odd, and uh, the remainder coordinates will determine uh, what the coordinate is. Um, note, and I should probably have pointed this out again earlier, so this is the same function that is used both for x and both for y. Uh, so this is also a little bit beautiful, uh, the, 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 the beauty of the simplicity of this construction here. So everything happens in two dimensions, but only one function defines the coordinate. So it's also because it is a square table that also simplifies things a little. Okay, so uh, let me try to move now to the Jupyter Notebook. So here is the Jupyter Notebook. Um, I executed this earlier, um, so I will scroll through this and let me... So now it's nice to see everything in one window. Um, so you see the init, the several pieces of the layout and the widgets and the data attributes, um, the coordinates of the position of the ball. Then the function that we have last uh, seen on the slide, then the drawing of the ball, then the animation. And let me see if I can do this and I should have executed everything. Um, so it is now executed. So here one sees the window of the animation and I am now um, probably have to add this. So here is the window. You see the um, ball uh, was rather at the edge so now it's um, going up and down, and uh, it's interesting, the arrows. So when I stop the animation and restart it, then it picks another angle. So here you see the ball bouncing back and forth. So if you perhaps can see here, uh, in the Jupyter Notebook, uh, I have this uh, star running. So as long as I do not close that window, uh, the cell is executing and uh, I'm kind of uh, stuck in that uh, window. Okay, so this is our uh, first animation. So let me get out of there. And uh, let me immediately use the Jupyter Notebook to go to the second animation. Um, so let me run all cells. And I am lucky here that uh, everything works out fine. Except that I have to scale things properly. Um, might be a bit okay excellent 
Okay, so what you see here is the four bar mechanism that is also called uh, Chebyshev's mechanism. Um, so this is not a basic graphical user interface and um, I may not be able to explain everything in uh, 10 minutes. But I think you get the idea of uh, the value of the graphical user interfaces to study uh, a more complicated object. So this Chebyshev uh, mechanism uh, translates um, horizontal uh, motion or, or straight line motion into circular motion. Um, this comes from the time of the steam engines. Uh, you could also see this differently. It also has applications where you are turning a crank and then uh, the end point of the mechanism traces a curve. There is, by the way, Kempis theorem that states that every algebraic curve can be realized by a mechanism. So that can also be visualized. So what are the widgets here? We have a canvas. Uh, we have uh, various uh, sliders. So I have the crank. Um, so let me clear everything. Um, now I can start and um, it uh, all of a sudden seems to go faster. So start and stop. Um, I can change the parameters. So here I'm turning up the, the crank. Either I can have a small wheel or a large wheel. Um, there is the length of all the bars, uh, so I can make them longer or shorter. So here you see now that there is another curve that is drawn. Um, so one can study uh, the type of curves that one can draw. Here you see the x and the y coordinates of the uh, end point. Um, of the end coordinates. I forgot there's also here another parameter. So this is uh, also almost uh, vertical still. Um, so okay. So let me go now back to the Jupyter notebook. So, uh, what do we have? So, in some sense, one needs to see the picture. Uh, it's very difficult to explain. Uh, so, we have a crank at length L, and there is an angle T. Then there is a point uh, that lies at distance R, uh, and that gives the first uh, equation. So, there is a set of equations that describes the location of the point X, Y. So there is the base point, um, that's the first base point. Uh, so the point D is kind of a very central point. So the point D is, is at also at the distance R from the crank. So we have the crank, the end point of the crank. So here the L cosine and the L sine. Uh, this equation expresses the coordinates X and Y as of distance r to the um, end point of the crank. Um, so the point d is the point that lies at distance little r from the point a0 and then it lies at and, and, and then we have the other bigger r uh, that's the distance from the from the endpoint of the crank. Now we have two equations, but with sines and cosines, we can turn this into an algebraic equation. So that then gives uh, a system in the parameters. So we have a polynomial system 
that defines the coordinates of x and y in function of the four parameters of the mechanisms. So we had these scales that are uh, defining the main parameters of this four bar mechanism. And this is essentially also uh, now a problem of computational algebraic geometry. Find expressions of x and y in function of the uh, sines and the cosine. So I will compute uh, what is called the Gröbner basis um, using SymPy. So I have all my letters. Uh, so the x and the y are the unknowns. We have the positions of the points uh, defined by A and then the angle T, the little r, the capital R, the length of the crank and then the sine and the cosine. So this gives uh, rise to these equations. So we have three equations, uh, two unknowns and then the parameters. Now, a lexicographical group in the basis will rewrite the given equations, and here they are. Um, it will simplify, and it doesn't really look like a simplification, but it has a triangular structure. It will allow me to rewrite x and y in function of the parameters. Uh, now, my time is not long enough to actually go through this analysis very carefully, but there are a number of uh, equations in there, so you see they are separated by the commas, and uh, some of the equations are linear in x and y, and one can solve explicitly in function of the parameters. And there is also a discriminant uh, sitting in there. Uh, so the discriminant uh, will, just like with the quadratic equation, will prevent us from getting into illegal uh, positions. So that also adds to the robustness of our model. Then we, let's go to the code now. So the, the, the discriminant, I will point uh, where it uh, appears. So we have the uh, parameters, the five parameters. So they are stored with initial values that correspond to the Chebyshev mechanism. And then we build up uh, the uh, coordinates for X and Y. So what actually happens in each time we have our parameter, uh, the critical parameter, the angle um, of the crank, and then all the values of the other parameters. So the angle here everything is evaluated. So we evaluate the cosine and the sine, and we have these auxiliary variables. So the square root uh, of the uh, discriminant uh, so is a symbolic expression in all the parameters. Uh, so this gets evaluated, and uh, the exception is prevented. Uh, so we will just have zero. Um, so then we have the coordinates, the x and the y coordinates. Um, so we have the x that can be written in function of y. Okay, so when we have the x and the y, uh, one does have then the connector point, and then there is the definition of the coupler point, that's the end point of the four bar mechanism. Um, okay, so uh, what actually happens here is that uh, this is still not the graphical user interface, so that is the mathematical model, so that is the four bar class that defines uh, the path, uh, so that defines uh, the mathematical model of the four bar. Um, and then in the other class, we will have the graphical user interface. So the graphical interface is a complete interface with the canvas, with uh, the entry widgets, with the scales, um, and the buttons uh, to start, to stop, or clear. So here we have the layout, and uh, what the previous class hides is actually the, the, the mathematical complexity of the model. 
on. So the advantage of having two classes, one class is focused on the visualization, the other class does the mathematical model. I will scroll through this uh, so you can see here the scale. Um, uh, the scale is another widget and here you see all the parameters. Um, so this is another appreciation of the keyword arguments. Um, and one has the main command that's to draw the mechanism. So the draw mechanism uh, is um, attached to these um, scales. So every time when the scale is touched, uh, the mechanism is redrawn. There is the entry widgets. So the entry widgets are very good widgets to display information as well. So here we can insert into uh, an entry widgets. Entry widgets are essentially for entering information, but they can also be used to display uh, the information. Okay, so then we have the updating of the values. Um, so we get uh, the parameters. So why do they need? Okay, so uh, every scale controls also a parameter. So and every time when the scales are being touched, they the values need to be updated. Um, and then we get at the actual um, drawing of the um, mechanism. with uh, several links, uh, the coupler coil point and um, then we see the animation. Okay, so let me now very briefly for the remaining two minutes uh, return to the um, slides. So the slides uh, are kind of uh, necessary also to explain the model. Uh, here you see the parameters again. Uh, so uh, the connector point uh, D, when we know the coordinates of X and Y of the connector point, then we essentially know the entire mechanism. Um, and that is explained here um, with the default uh, values. Here one sees the uh, GUI again. Um, that was done on a Mac. Uh, so I should have pointed this out. Uh, so graphical user interfaces, uh, the Kinter is used for platform independent uh, design of graphical user interfaces. So the same code will run on Windows or uh, Linux or a Mac platform. Um, this is very interesting. Um, very important as well. Um, so the um, example uh, also is a good illustration of uh, the many widgets that one can use in uh, a graphical user interface. The four bar uh, class uh, deals with the mathematical complexity. Um, and then uh, at the very end, I can say something about computational algebraic geometry. So here is the model as a system of equations. And the system of equations is simple enough to allow for an explicit symbolic elimination. So we can separate uh, the values of the coupler, uh, of uh, the coordinates of the connector. Uh, we can separate them from the parameters. Um, which is very interesting. So this will not work in general, but uh, for this setup, it actually works. So with computer algebra, we can actually translate. Um, so I used uh, these formulas here. So the Z1 and the Z2 are the auxiliary quantities to define Y. And there we need the square root of the discriminant. Um, so everything reduces to a quadratic equation, essentially. Um, 
The complexity is in the discriminant, uh, a complicated formula that can also then be used essentially to figure out in the study of these mechanisms what are the singular uh, positions. Okay, I'm going over time. Uh, Tik Inter is very vast, uh, but I hope that this lecture has introduced you to the, um, give you a taste on how you can get started with building graphical user interfaces. Okay, I hope this was interesting, and uh, here is one of the suggestions for the exercises. Uh, make the um, GUI for the billiards uh, more interesting, where you give the user also much more control over the speed of the ball and whether uh, a part needs to be drawn or not. Um, so there are many uh, additions that can be made. So thank you. For